other than one small itsy bitsy tiny shower, it did not rain all week. True, it was 101, I understand, but it didn't rain all week. And why is that important? Because there's this place we went years ago called Crystal Springs. There's several things I remember about that place. Um, one of was the, we worshiped in their gymnasium. It had no air conditioning at all. And during worship breaks, not only was the food in the walk-in cooler and the walk-in freezer, people were in the walk-in cooler and the walk-in freezer just trying to stop sweating. Then they'd return to the sweat box and wait for another break so we could go stand in the coolers and the freezers. It was horrible, horrible. But that wasn't the biggest problem. I'd say 90% of the jobs we had to do that year were out to exterior outside painting. And I remember one place got painted because the rain didn't really start till Monday afternoon. And when it started, it poured and it poured and it poured and it poured day after day after day with the whole week. And some people were working on this one house on Monday and they were painting their little hearts out, making progress. And the look on their faces was not priceless, it was horrible. The rain kicked in. Not a sprinkle, a rain. And when it kicked in, they got to stand there and watch as everything they just painted slid down the wall. So the one thing you don't want on mission trip, if at all possible, is rain. Because it knocks out jo jobs that are in for lawn care and it knocks out jobs for painting. It was a great trip. Uh, it was awesome. I, I look forward to next year. Always look forward to the one yet to come. Now, one thing that was, um, for me, maybe not for you guys, but for me, on the night that we arrived, uh, I had purchased a seven-day candle to kind of chart the week, watch the week, and to uh, commemorate the week. And I wanted it that after it was all done, I wanted to be able to keep that candle as a, a memento from this trip. So the candle that's on the floor in this plastic jug jar thing is the candle that we lit last Sunday night. And I didn't want to have to call them and tell them that they lied, that the candle didn't make it seven days. And we lit it. And um, I don't remember what night it was. Was it Wednesday? Tuesday? Um, well, you know, when I speak, I get a little rambunctious. and I wave my hands a lot. Well, I karate chopped the candle <clears throat> in the process of speaking. And uh, at first, I didn't know what I hit because I really wasn't watching what I was doing. And then when I looked down, my heart sank, and I was in horror that I had just killed <laughs> the seven-day candle on the third day. Things are supposed to rise on the third day, not die on it. So I killed it, I thought. But I looked down, it was laying on its side, and the wick was still lit. Of course, a lot of the wax was on the table we were using for a communion table, and I filled up this cloth napkin with wax. But I picked it back up, and I set it back on its stand. It was still lit. And then people were saying, well, Dean, I don't know if it's going to make it seven days anymore since you karate chopped it and knocked the wax out. I said, you're probably right. So at least I was happy that the flame was still lit, sad that I had karate chopped it and thought that it might make it to Thursday or Friday. And people were going up every day measuring. Oh, well, well, Dean, I mm, might make it, might make it. I said, well, I just want to see if it can make it preferably at least to Friday night when we have closing worship. And it made it through. And I thought, that's great, wonderful. But then I thought, well, wouldn't it be even better if it made it to Sunday because that would be the seventh day for the seven-day candle. So I thought, well, how am I going to get it home? I put it in my car on the way home in the cup holder. And at first I was driving very much like a, about a 98-year-old man, making sure I didn't turn too quickly really slow. Well, eventually Dean forgot that the candle was even there. 
Then I returned to proper driving, which is the speed of Dean, which is whatever he kind of picks at the moment. Um, and I thought, oh my gosh, I'll probably just kill the candles again. And I looked down and the candle was still lit. Got here after coming home and the candle was still lit. I thought, well, Lord, it'd be awesome if it just made it to morning worship on Sunday. That'd be divine. Well, here we are in the seven-day candle after all of its turmoil and travels has made it this morning. Yeah, the candle. Um, so I don't have to call them up. In fact, I can call them up and say it was really probably an eight or nine-day candle because I did kill it on the second or third day. Um, there is nothing, and Joel already mentioned, that, you know, uh, Malaysia being saved. Uh, there is nothing that we did on that trip work-wise or fellowship-wise or worship-wise or uh, dealing with the community, Miss Stepney, uh, the painting. All those things were awesome and, and wonderful, but when somebody gives their life to Jesus, they get saved. There is nothing, nothing that is better than that. Uh, so, uh, and uh, she was, it was awesome. Uh, she was, she prayed and gave her life to Jesus, then she was just crying. I thought, I said, are you okay? I'm just so excited. And she was, so I said, oh, they're tears of excitement, not tears of fear or, or sadness. So that was awesome. That is the most important thing that happens on our trip to Columbia. But there are many. So what I'd like to do next Sunday, uh, so we can have more pictures, uh, you folks that went on mission trips, start thinking a little bit, because I'd like next Sunday to be a Sunday where we uh, share mission trip number 18 and show some slides and tell, give some testimonies and try to share with you that did not get to go um, what happened for us and how we enjoyed it and what it did for us. So next Sunday will be Mission Trip Sunday uh, to share with the congregation and on live streaming as well. So if you have pictures that you have not uh, uploaded, downloaded, whatever kind of load uh, that you need to do and get them to Maria, please do so so that we can get ready for next Sunday. I, I can't give really many a lot of instances, but I can tell you that for the first time that I've been on a trip like this, really the first time I've hung out with the church for a lengthy period of time, day after day after day, and heard this phrase, either Pastor Dean or Brother Dean or Apostle Dean or Mr. Dean, you're so old. I didn't just hear that once. I didn't just hear it twice. Eventually, I, 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 I think I made it up to number 17, and I stopped counting because I thought I don't want them to tell me so many times it matches my age of 60. Um, I wore the pants I'm wearing today. They're actually shorts in honor of Caleb Hill. I was going to wear jeans, but I did wear jean shorts on the trip. He said, oh, my God, I can't believe you're wearing jorts. And I said, Wearing what? Jorts. I said, George, George. I had no idea what the man was talking about. He said, you know, jean shorts, jorts. He said, I would never wear those. He's acting like I would never be caught dead in those things. So, no, I did not run and go change clothes either. This is what I said, Caleb, I'm old. Let me be old. I can wear jorts. And I also want to show you that it's true, that when you get old, I always thought it was, when I looked at old men over the years, they have hairy legs, but the bottom part of their leg is not hairy. And I thought, well, maybe they just wear too tight at socks and it rubs the hair off. And uh, <laughs> Michelle told me, no, Dean, that's, that's part of you getting old. That's what happens to old men. Eventually, most all the hair on your legs will be non-existent, and it starts at the bottom and works its way up. So, um... Yes, folks, I'm old, but I'm still alive, and God is good, and uh, things are great. So, um, uh, oh, one other thing. Um, I got told I was kind of old last night because some of my children got together, and they wanted to buy me, I think they're called AirPods. I have one in my ear. Um, I keep wanting to go get a Q-tip because I think my ear stopped up. But, it, you know, it's, it's there. And I didn't realize it talks to me. Every time I get a message, text or WhatsApp, it starts talking in my ear. Uh, so I said, how do I turn it on? And where does it charge? And my children were just kind of like shaking their head like, 
well, well can, I, can I talk on my phone with this in my ear? Yes, Dad, you don't even need your phone. You just hit this. I said, where's the button on the thing? And they just all kept giving me eye rolls and, and sighs and exasperations. And I said, well, Joseph, what, how do I do this and this and this with it? Dad, you could go to YouTube and, and watch something about it. I said, well, you know what I'd prefer is for you to just tell me what to do with it. I don't want to go watch YouTube. I don't want somebody on the screen tell. I want my children to say, this is how it works. Punch here. I still can't find the button. I guess you just hit it and hope it, hope it does what you want it to do. Uh, we'll find out. And I was going to put both of them in my ears last night. I said, well, Dad, you don't really need to do that either. You only need one. And then when it runs down in battery, you put the other one in. I said, so I have to carry them with me. Yes, and in the case. So um, now I'm an old man with an AirPod. And not only the AirPods, they're AirPod Pro. I have no idea what the difference is, but I got AirPod Pro. Um, so I know ministry is about to change radically because I've moved into the uh, 21st century and I'm 60. Be that as it may, let us continue. The theme for the week was for such a time. Now, my daughter Erin admitted yesterday while we were eating dinner that she kept calling our trip because she didn't get to go. She thinks she's pregnant or something, uh, and she did not get to go. And she said, I kept calling your theme once upon a time. <laughs> and like she really thought, I guess it was once upon a time. I said, not more like Cinderella or Beauty and the Beast. Um, but it was not. Once upon a time, but once upon a time, we did go on a mission trip to Colombia, and our theme was for such a time as. Now, if you, if you know the scripture, it comes from Esther, and it continues on to say for such a time as this. So all week we talked about time and seasons and what does God want and uh, kicking things into gear, listening to what we're told, and that God calls us to very specific times in life and ministry, and um, we need to be ready to seize the moment and grasp the call, go full seam ahead and not dilly-dally, and do what it is we need to do that God is telling us to do. We'll share more about that next Sunday as we share about a mission trip. Oh, I did, I, oh, 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 um, I forgot to make an announcement that Erica told me to announce. There will be no women's Bible study tomorrow night because she's getting her wisdom teeth chopped out tomorrow. And she kind of knows that some of that was sort of what I wanted to do as a living instead of pastoring. Uh, God said no. I did offer to chop them out for her for free because that would bring me great enjoyment. Not because I want to torture Erica, but the experience of chopping out teeth excites me. Uh, and I offered to do it for free. Might have hurt, might have bled a little bit. She declined the offer. Um, and then she told me not to, that they're not having Bible study tomorrow night. And I wrote myself a note up here, which I almost forgot to read, my own note. I just noticed something, though. My note reads, written in Dinoglyphics, reads, no women's BS tomorrow. <laughs> ladies, you're not going to have any BS tomorrow or any Bible study. Got it? Good. Um, we're going to talk about two experiences and situations that Jesus dealt with. You've heard these stories millions of times, probably. But as we look at for such a time as this, we're not really talking so much about what we want, but what God wants. And we also learned on our trip that you should take everything you do, and God wants to be intricately involved in everything that you do and see how it kind of fits into the, to the plan. Well, we're not that different, ladies and gentlemen, than people who lived 2,000 years ago. The, they often thought the same type of things. 
they often dealt with the same type of things. They were not as technologically as advanced as we are or as I'm becoming. Um, but life was life. So Jesus, in Mark 17, starting with verse 7, or Mark 10, starting with verse 17, um, Jesus was about to have an encounter with some, someone, and obviously it was a very memorable encounter because the gospel writers put fairly detailed story, a truth, as they were writing the gospels. In Mark 10, starting with verse 17, as Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. Good teacher, he asked, what must I do to, in to inherit eternal life? Stop. Jesus was a man on a mission, but notice he had time to stop along the way and handle business. He did not reject the people. He would stop, even though he was a man on, he knew exactly where he was headed, what he was doing, and then he, people would come up to him, I'm sure, all the time. Well, this very wealthy man came up to Jesus and he didn't just say, hi, Jesus, what's, what, you know, I think the expression is, what's up? There's none of that. He just ran up to him and fell on his knees. Why? Because he obviously realized that this guy he was dealing with was not any ordinary guy. But he's from God. He asked the question, what must I do to inherit everlasting or eternal life. He said, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. The point was, Jesus is God. You know the commandments? Come on. You should not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not give false testimony. You shall not defraud and honor mother and father. Teacher, he declared, all these I have kept since I was a boy. So he thought he had it made and he was in the clear because Jesus talked about the law. And teacher, I've done every single one of those just like I should as I was a little boy from, now, from then till now. So I'm sure he was quite happy and pleased. He thought he had gotten the answer. He thought that that was, that's probably where Jesus is going to wrap it up. Follow these laws and you've got it made. I've done that. And sometimes we only want to grab from Jesus what we want. We don't wait for the rest of the story. We don't wait for God to finish his statements. We don't wait for God or Jesus or Holy Spirit to tell us more detail about what we're called to do or supposed to do. We take, once we hear something we like, we stop. But I have learned over the years that oftentimes we hear things from God that we like. But how do I know sometimes very much so when it's definitely of God? I don't want to do it. Or it's going to be hard. Or it's going to require me to sacrifice something. It's going to make me do something I'm not really either ready for or want to do. That's how I know, ooh, that's got to be a God thing. Because it's going to take God-sized power and I don't want to do it. Well, he didn't, he didn't want to hear the rest of the story, but of course, Jesus being Jesus, finished. Jesus looked at him and what? Loved him. Now, see, we think that God stops loving us when we're naughty or disobedient. God does not stop loving you. He never stops loving you, and he will not love you any more tomorrow than he does today. He didn't love you any more yesterday than he does today. His love never ceases for even people that do not obey and are disobedient or cocky or arrogant or lazy or whatever the case would be. He says, one thing you lack. So I'm sure in his brain, for just another moment, he thought, wow, okay, I made it through the first thing. All I had to do was keep these commandments. Oh, amen, he's only got one more thing to say. But here's where things begin to change. Because what he was about to be told 
He did not want to hear for such a time as now. And Jesus was giving him his for such a time as right now. I'm calling you to do this. What he was about to hear, he did not want to hear. One thing you lack, he said. Go. Sell everything you have and give to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. Stop. What did Jesus just tell him to do? Step one. Sell every single thing you own. All of it. Get rid of all your money, all of it. Give it all away to poor people. And after you have completed that first step, I need you to come back to me and follow me. Was this man being called to be a disciple? Yes. Maybe not one of the big 12, but yes. Jesus doesn't talk like this for the fun of it. Jesus talks like this when he's calling and tugging, and he wanted this man to be a part of ministry. Come follow me. But before you do, go do this and this and this. Well, the man asked a question, and he wanted an answer. Be careful sometimes what you ask for, because you might get the answer. And sometimes the answer we get is not exactly the answer we were hoping for. In fact, very often with God, like I said a while ago, when we pray, the answer that we get when it's not exactly what we're hoping for, we like to then say, I must have misheard. The only reason we say that is because we still didn't like what, was, what we were told. If you don't like what God is telling you, it's a very good chance that God is speaking. Truth. Things changed. So now he's been given instructions, sell everything and come follow me. Now what did the man do? Oh yes, Jesus, that's awesome. Hallelujah, I want to be one of your disciples. Being with you is better than breathing. Being with you is so holy and awesome, and you love me and I love you, and this is going to be great God stuff. Uh, no. He did something that we most often do. At this, the man's face fell. Face fell. What does that mean? Have you ever seen somebody laughing and smiley and then all of a sudden something happens or comes their way and the smiley happy 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 goes from smiley happy 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 to sullen slobby and depressed. Our emotions can change just like that. Our facial expressions can change just like that. And often they do. Smiley, happy, smiley, happy until something comes our way where it's not smiley, happy anymore. And then the happy, smiley face is gone. Well, he, his face got sad. His countenance fell. He went from being happy to sad to being joyful and stressed out now. All in one moment in time. Whose time was it? Jesus' time. Jesus wanted him to understand it's Jesus' time time. And his face fell. Why? Well, he went away sad because he had great wealth. He was filthy rich. Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Stop. See, all of us in the room, unless there's something you haven't told me, are not filthy, 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 disgustingly rich. Anybody in here like that and forgot to tell me? Anybody in here worth 44, 45 million? No? Okay. Well, then I'm glad that this story does not apply to me. Because unless I've got 44 million because that's what Dean said, 44 million, I'm in the clear. 
I got this, Jesus. You and me, we're going to hang out because I've got less than $44 million. Where did I get that number? I don't know. I made it up. $44 million. Um, wrong. Jesus was not addressing the man because he was filthy, disgustingly, dirty, rich, worth millions of dollars. He wasn't attacking the man at all. And he wasn't telling him, you're naughty because you've got money, bad boy. No. It really had nothing to do with money at all. It had to do with the man. The man was in love with his money. The man liked his money. The man liked his rich lifestyle. The man enjoyed who he was. He was a ruler of some kind. He liked his money. He liked his bank account, which was probably a backyard and a sack underneath some sand. But he liked his bank account. It was fluffy. He had been a good boy since childhood. So he thought he was doing all the religiously correct things to do. But for some reason, he's thinking, wait, wait, it's not good enough for God. Well, for you and me, it may be true that none of us in here are rich. None of us in here are worth $44 million and probably never will be. But I have things that I want to hold on to, and you have things that you want to hold on to. There are things I want to do, and there are things that you want to do that sometimes God doesn't want us to do. And we are smart enough and maybe spiritual enough to know that God is saying, you don't need that, you don't need that, you need to drop that, you need to stop doing that. But we don't because we like it. It's our security blanket. It sometimes defines who we are. And for him to ask, basically, me to give up me is rude. For him to give up me is just not right. For me to give up me, God, you expect too much. You want everything. And the answer to that is, you're right. He does. He died, so he's in charge of everything. He rose again for you, for me to deliver us from death and let us go live in the heavenlies. He has the right to ask whatever he wants. And not only does he have the right to ask whatever he wants, he has the right to get whatever he wants. From all of us, Dean, you, uh, all of us. He has the right to expect to receive everything he wants. But a good chunk of the time, in fact, most of the time, we do not give him everything he wants. So figuratively, our smiley faces turn sad when we hear something from God that we did not want to hear. But sometimes when we ask God, God, I want this, how do I get it? We really want to hear what Jesus has to say because we think all the Jesus stuff has got to be good. But the whole time we're thinking and praying, I hope. I hope that what I'm about to hear matches what I want. Lord God, I'm going to pray to you, and I want, I, I want this in my life, and I want to see more of you. Tell me how to do it. But please, Lord, let me hear what I want to hear. Please, Lord, let me get what I want to get. Please, Lord, don't mess up any of my plans. Please, Lord, don't, 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 don't expect me to do that, which I cannot do. You know I'm weak. You know I'm strong. I'm, you know I'm this. And I, I just wish you would pay attention to who I am and what my needs are and take all that into consideration before you give me your answer. Say, Dean, I have never prayed that prayer you just prayed. Oh, I'm sure you have. You may not have used all those words, but it was what you were thinking or feeling. And God's smart, and he knows what we're thinking and what we're feeling, and so we might as well say it. You're very rich, people, and so am I. Maybe not with $44 million, but that's not the kind of rich we're talking. We're talking about the kind of rich that we've been inherited or been blessed with in life, and it stands in the way of God getting what God wants. And please do note, for those of you who see yourselves as impoverished, no one in this room today is impoverished. 
None of you today are eating grits tonight, macaroni and cheese tomorrow, and uh, a pile of rice the next day, hoping to just survive. If you own a car or you rent a car, you own a house or you rent a house, you own an apartment or you rent an apartment, you own a condo or you rent a condo, you're filthy, disgustingly rich in comparison to the rest of the majority of the world. But again, God's not talking about money here so much. He's talking about anything unique to me that stands between me and Jesus and to let me not step out in such a time as this and do what he wants. So we're going to flip over now to John. John chapter 21. And uh, you've heard this before as well. So we have one man just ask Jesus, what do I need to do? He tells him. He gets upset because he, at that time in his life, for such a time as that, at that time in his life, it was unacceptable to the rich young man. Unacceptable, God. Unacceptable. Now notice, though, and I've told you this before, that when the rich young ruler walked away all sad, Jesus did not chase him down and beat him over the head with a baseball bat and say, you shall follow me. Same thing's true for me today and same thing's true for you as well. You can decline the God offer. You can decline the God offer. You can say, uh-uh, 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 not today, Lord. He will not chase you down and beat you over the head with a baseball bat, begging and pleading for you to please come do what he wants and follow him. He's not going to do that. And many people think, I'm going to wait till he beats me over the head with the baseball bat and makes me follow him. He's not going to make you do anything. So if you're waiting for him to make you, it's not going to happen. Boy, what kind of God is that? He won't make me do what he wants. If he made you, you would be a slave, not a servant. If he made you, you would have no free will and no choice. God wants you to choose, choose you this day who you will serve. And Joshua said, as far as me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose. Oh, God, can I choose later? This time will come, and this time will go. And you do not know if this particular offering from the Lord or set of instructions will remain two weeks from now. Because God is going to keep on moving till he finds who will listen to him and do what he asks. That's for me. That's for you. Chapter 21 of John, early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not know. They didn't realize it was Jesus. He called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? This is after Jesus rose from the dead. No, they answered. He said, throw your net on the side of the boat, right side of the boat. You will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul the net in because of the large number of fish. Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. As soon as Simon Peter heard, Peter heard him say that, it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. This time he did not walk on water. He jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, typical, towing the net of full fish for they were not far from shore, about a hundred yards. When they landed, they saw a fire of burning coals. And there were fish on it and some bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have just caught. Remember that word, caught. Simon Peter climbed back into the boat, dragged the net ashore. It was full of large fish, 153. But even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. None of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. So obviously Jesus looked a little bit different after resurrection. He was probably in his partial, holy, glorious self. But they dare not ask, who are you? 
Peter already jumped in the war, into the water. John already acknowledges it's Jesus. The rest of them are sitting there with their mouths hanging open. Because they didn't expect to see Jesus, even though he told them, I will raise on the third day. He told them that. And they still didn't listen, and they still didn't believe, and they went on doing what they wanted rather than what he told them to do. And then when he showed up, it was like, whoa, it's really Jesus. Wasn't expecting that. Why not? Why were they not expecting what he said would happen? There's only one word in there I really want you to focus on. And the praise worship team can go ahead and come up. Verse 10, Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish. You have just caught. The fish got caught. I understand that, Dean. The fish got caught. The fishermen got caught not doing what they were called to do. I've been held in your 